Good, Good morning. morning. I'm Chris Harbaugh. And I'm Mary Sia. Welcome to Southwest Wing's online speaker series. Once again, we're so happy to have you there. Yep, and we're particularly pleased this morning to welcome Kathy Anderson as our guest speaker. Kathy's a very keen birder, and uh, she uh, is a regular supporter of Southwest Wings, both as a speaker and uh, leading walks as well. So wonderful to have Kathy here, who's going to be talking about one of my favorite families of birds. So over to Kathy. Hello, Kathy. Let's see you there. Hi. And hey. there she is. <laughs> Welcome to the world of you. <laughs> can't see you. It's interesting. I am somehow only seeing a small screen. I think I'm going to get out of the meeting and come back in with the hope that I will see that it will work because I what's up on my screen says post attendee Zoom. So that's not what we want. Um, and I don't know how to get back to where I need to be and without leaving. So I'm going to... Okay, leave. it's probably on another window. Uh, one of your other windows. Uh, not according to what I can see here. All right. Now let me get out and I'll come right back yeah. in. Okay, we'll be here. All come right. in as a panelist. Thank you. So we, we're still seeing you. Oops, that wasn't the right one. That's curious because I can't see me. <laughs> Can you see yourself now? No, I, uh, I'm coming into uh, uh, webinar registration. I apologize for this. I'm, I'm not at all sure what, why it changed. Um, I see you guys, but I just can't, I can't make you, oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's just not quite seamless, is it, <laughs> sometimes? Sometimes. That's all right. It's all about flexibility this year. Yeah. Yep. We're all shape changing. Wonders of modern technology. All right. So I guess you, do you make me uh, co host and then I can share my screen or I can well, do that? Actually, I tried to do that to see if it would change your situation, but you don't have to. You can share your screen anyway. So okay. go ahead whenever you're ready, Kath. I am sharing my screen right now, I hope. All right. There you go. Okay. And now I need to get to slideshow and from the beginning. All right, can everybody see this beginning of the slideshow here? Yeah, we can put hands up if you can. All righty. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, Thanks for being here this morning. Sorry about the confusion on, the, on uh, some of the technology, but here we'll go ahead and talk about um, bluebirds, robins, and thrushes. They're all in the same family, uh, and we're only going to talk about a, about a 10 of them. Um, and we'll start with the bluebirds and then move into the robins and, and uh, thrushes. Uh, and hopefully um, we'll have some, um, some interaction on, on this. What uh, my handout indicated is that there, I had oh, several questions on there with uh, multiple choice answers. A few of those are embedded in this um, uh, PowerPoint, uh, but lots of them are not, and they may inspire some other questions. We're going to hold all the questions until the end, however, although we will try to do a little polling with the, um, with the questions um, as uh, they come up in the PowerPoint. So just for starters here, we have um, a uh, uh, Eastern bluebird on the top left, a hermit thrush in the middle, a, a mountain bluebird on the top right, a Townsend solitaire on the bottom left, a varied thrush in the middle, and, and then our iconic American robin on the uh, bottom right. So let's go down to our first uh, bird here. This is our Eastern bluebird. And uh, what I'd like to point out for uh, folks who are not familiar with this bird and are familiar only with the Western bluebird is the Eastern bluebird has an all blue back. 
our Western bluebirds have a rusty back. And uh, otherwise they're very, very similar um, to look at. But I did want to include a, a baby bird photo on the bottom right there, because these little baby birds look like entirely different birds. Um, and this one's getting, it looks like it's about ready to get some, some, some yummy lunch here uh, with, with some, some mealworms, it looks like to me. So there is um, the range map for the Eastern Bluebird. And as you can see, it is largely in the East, um, year round in the South, and then it migrates North to um, uh, New England and uh, lower parts of Canada and the Midwest to breed. Um, in wintering uh, in Texas um, and into New Mexico a little bit. But what I really want to point out is, is that it's within the last couple of decades that we, uh, we believe we have an entirely different subspecies of eastern bluebird um, here in, uh, in Arizona. You can see that little green blob there it runs into the southeast corner of, of Arizona. Um, I will, and the subspecies called, is called the Azure or Mexican bluebird. And um, uh, it's, it looks very much like the Eastern bluebird, except it's a little bit paler. I've only seen it once or twice and it's been in the Patagonia area, but isn't that an interesting range map where it is entirely separated from um, the, the bluebirds of the East and it's a year round bird. So. Uh, if you're in the Patagonia area, particularly um, in, in um, the, the grasslands and, and the, the lower elevations of Patagonia, which is still, uh, still 4,000 feet or so, um, you know, make sure you're not seeing western bluebirds. You may be seeing eastern bluebirds uh, there. So as to the eastern population, um, uh, this is your first uh, quiz, if you will. Um, will this work, Marie? Yep, one second. I'm going to switch and be able to put something up for you guys. Okay. All right. So um, all the questions have three answers. That doesn't necessarily mean that only one answer is true. So she's going to put up the question. We're going to do a quick poll. I think we have uh, 15 or 30 seconds uh, to indicate... Um, uh, what your best guess for the answer is, or maybe you know for All sure. All right, we've got some activity going on. People are getting their answers in. Oh, this is God. exciting. On, on my screen, it's just, I can't vote. <laughs> we can't vote. No, we're not voting. No. <laughs> so, yeah, it's coming up on five, four, three, two. One end of poll, folks. Okay, so all right, let's share our results. All righty. Can you see the the poll there, Kath? I cannot. Ah. Uh. <laughs> so what are what are the results? You if you can see it. <laughs> oh, okay. Let me share the results. Let's see. Oh, that. there we go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um. You were all right. <laughs> this. Oh. This is an answer that um, is, uh, every one of you is, is accurate. Pesticide use, definitely. Um, the switch from wooden fence posts to metal fence posts. Wooden fence posts are actually nesting sites for um, these guys, uh, to the extent that there would be a hole in them, um, or in a, say a downy woodpecker would enlarge the hole to make its own nest. Um, those, they don't, can't do that in a, in a metal post. So the nesting sites have gone down and the switch from large, small farms to large farms makes a big difference as well. Um, that is because if, you know, there's an illustration there with a small farm on the, on the, um, uh, uh, left and the small farms are the smaller fields with intervening, um, areas of habitat. Uh, might be small trees, it might be shrubs, it might be uh, wooden fence posts, um, and they would, those would be um, a good, good habitat uh, for the, the bluebirds to uh, um, roost in, if, if not nest, and, um, and also uh, just to hide from predators as well. So all three answers were right on that. Well, thanks, Mar Mary. We'll, we'll try another one. <laughs> Sounds good. That was great. Have a good All right. Let's see if I can. Oh, my. Uh... 
My PowerPoint is not advancing here. That's weird. No, it is not. There we go. Oh, there's the Western Bluebird. Good. All right. Okay, I mean, got stuck after the poll, I guess. <laughs> so here's our Western Bluebird. And um, in terms of identification, very similar to the Eastern Bluebird. Um, the Western Bluebird baby's a little bit different in the in that it doesn't have quite the scaly look, or maybe this one's just a little bit older than the baby we saw for the Eastern Bluebird. But you can see the little rusty um, cape or back, back patch on, on the Western Bluebird. Um, I have to say that, that bluebirds as a genus are unique to the United States. Nowhere else, um, and, and their migratory areas uh, further south. But it's, um, there, there are no bluebirds in the, uh, of the same genus anywhere else in, in the world. So uh, consider ourselves lucky to have the, the eastern, western, and mountain bluebirds. So um, here's, here's the question for um, uh, the Western blue, but I don't think we've got this one up as a poll. So um, it, uh, I want you to just go ahead and read it and you can, you can uh, decide what the answer is. And I will let you know momentarily. There's a classic bluebird nest up on the top there and some little bitty bluebirds on the top right. Uh, you'll notice that the bluebird eggs are, what should I say, robin's egg blue. Um, and they are, they are blue, just like, like robin's eggs. Smaller, of course. All right, so what's the answer here? Um, the answer is partly A. It is not promiscuity on the part of the female. She is probably making um, very selective choices about who are fathers of her. Um, oh, you're going to go ahead and put it up as a as a uh, uh, poll. So let's see what so what happens here. <laughs> I'm right behind you, Kathy. <laughs> So we're we getting some answers in. We're getting some answers in. Okay. Lots of people are participating. That's Five, good. four, three, two, one. All right. Let's see what the results okay. are. Okay. So I started to answer that it is partly uh, A is an answer, it's, although the female is not being promiscuous, which is you know, sort of random um, sex with, uh, you know, the opposite sex. But uh, uh, she is probably being choosy and spreading her, her, uh, her genes with select males. Um, it, it probably is, could be attention on the part of the defending male. He may not be, um, he may not be uh, paying as much attention to, to, to who other males around there. Um, and it, it probably is not the practice of communal nesting. That has not been observed in, these, um, in this species. Okay, we'll go on, hopefully my my, uh, <laughs> does, doesn't want to advance after this. <laughs> that's, that's it's time maybe. for a nice deep breath. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> right. It does not want to, there we go. <laughs> yeah, I guess it is just a deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's the mountain bluebird, and this one I will uh, ask to, to get a poll on the share. Uh, the mountain bluebird is all over blue, the male on the top left there. No rust on the chest, no rust on the back, and a different color blue. I always think of this blue as being like parts of the sky have dropped. It's just a stunning almost electric blue. Um, for those of you familiar with Arizona blue skies, our sky can be so dazzling. Um, and I feel like the mountain bluebirds <laughs> reflect that. Um, the female, not so much. She's, she's um, more um, subtly colored, blue in her own right. And she can be kind of tough to tell from, from um, females of, of Western or East Western bluebirds, because these guys are only in the West. Um, 
she can have a little bit of a or look like she has a little bit of hint of you know the rusty color if, if the light is is um, um, tricky so all right so here's the pole mary we can go with this one oh you're right on top of this one <laughs> yep how could how could she not pay attention to that dazzling blue bird <laughs> Yes, we're getting a lot of responses again. Okay, and excellent. Thank you folks for being um, tuned in. Yeah, this is, this is great. I I yeah. much prefer giving uh, presentations um, in person because it, the interactive part is so much fun. Um, so you're, you're filling that niche <laughs> for me. Okay. Well, this is fun. Yeah, all right. So in, in this case, um, B is correct. Um, and it, yeah, <laughs> how could it not be, how could she not pay attention to him? But she's not, she is actually, um, looking at the nesting cavities that he's offering. He may have more than one. Um, and, um, he, he is, he is not, um, trying to attract her, um, uh, by his singing. Um, C would be, um, true in a lot of other species, but not necessarily this one. Um, it's, it's interesting because uh, females often look for kind of a holistic health uh, um, for the male. But in this case, uh, maybe it's because nesting isn't that easy for mountain bluebirds. These are bluebirds of the open spaces and finding a good nest cavity for them. Um, they, they, um, they uh, will have to be in cliffs or in hidden spots or, or whatever. Um, they, according to my notes, they're often in knot holes, the nests, um, or small rock fissures. They uh, prefer dry um, places in, um, the, in the grasslands and within three feet of the ground uh, with the nests oriented away from approaching storms. So, kind of picky up in the grasslands there, <laughs> kind of hard to come by. So you can see why that's a, a more important uh, aspect of the bluebird. Um, I'm gonna, while I'm gonna try to advance the slide here, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, the, they are cavity nesters, often in an abandoned woodpecker hole. Um, they have to defend that hole from, um, uh, other birds like house sparrows and house wrens, um, and, but not so much from um, uh, cowbirds because uh, cowbirds don't necessarily uh, parasitize this particular uh, species. All right, I'm trying to advance here. And it's not cooperating. I don't know, Kathy, if you want to answer a question that came in in Q&As. Oh, well, you're going forward. Oh, uh, you go ahead. All right, it looks like Nancy Gugin um, asked a question about these two bluebirds have not been formally split thus far. The Eastern, yeah, no, the, the Eastern um, bluebird, yes, the Azure bluebird is considered a subspecies now of the, the Eastern bluebird. It has got a new name, but, uh, as I say, also Mexican bluebird, but it has not been um, officially split. Yes, thanks for clarifying that. Thank you. Anything else? Not at the moment. Okay, so right. this... This is a typical Eastern bluebird nesting box um, arrangement. They're very picky about the size of the hole. So if you want to attract, if you have a, an area where you think you can, you can get bluebirds to nest um, here in Arizona, um, you might want to look more closely at, at the size of the hole for Western bluebirds. I assume it's going to be very similarly sized, um, but here's a, here's a classic um, uh, kit for a bluebird nest and, and you'll probably see some of these bluebird boxes up in in um, natural areas uh, particularly swampy areas uh, if you're traveling in the east you'll see them all over the east because the bluebird population is really plummeted um, and there are a lot of people who are interested in bringing the bluebirds back and so there are a lot of uh, uh, areas Audubon sites and things like that where the they erect bluebird boxes 
Um, and there, there's uh, the inside of the nest. You've, you've seen a couple of photos already. Um, and you can see on the top uh, right there, uh, a parent bluebird helping to, to feed the youngsters there. Um, very, very blue. <laughs> uh, and as they grow, um, you know, it gets a little bit crowded in there and um, they will need to fledge and, and um, but there are so, plenty of, of reasons why they don't fledge. And these are some of the hazards to a bluebird nest. And you can see uh, most, most of those you, you recognize, uh, screech owl and the snake of some kind. Um, the one in the middle is cowbird egg pred predation. Um, uh, this is the, the eastern bluebird. Uh, so not so much the mountain bluebird, but uh, definitely the eastern bluebird. I don't know how that little um, a weasel got in a bluebird nest. Maybe um, it wasn't completely closed, but um, it's not easy being a bluebird. <laughs> All right. We're going on to the Townsend Solitaire now. On the uh, left is, a, is an adult, and both adults look pretty much the same. On the right is a Townsend Solitary baby. Boy, can if you saw that bird, um, and I've never seen a youngster, um, I don't think I would recognize it. Uh, it doesn't even have a hint of, um, you know, the coloring of, of a, an adult solitaire by being kind of bland on the back. The spotted um, coloration is all over. You saw some of those spotted um, arrangements on the bluebirds, um, true on the solitaire as well. Obviously by shape and size, you might know this bird but I've never seen one. And I'd, I'd be interested if anybody has seen one and whether they've seen it in this stage where it is all over speckledy. That's, it's, that's pretty, pretty amazing to me. <laughs> all right, so here's your question if you wanna go ahead and answer this one. Um, who, who is this named after? What kind of fellow was, uh, t was John Townsend? Um, we have a photo of him there. We getting some answers in? We got some answers in. Countdown's on. Two, one. Okay. All right. Here's our results. <laughs> yeah, and the <laughs> answer here is all three. He was a well-educated Quaker from Philadelphia. He was a lifelong naturalist um, and he was a failed dentist. I don't know whether he uh, gave up dentistry um, uh, you know, right after he was stabbed, <laughs> or uh, um, you know, whether that was just uh, part of a, of a on, ongoing problem. I do want to say something about um, uh, identifying. I'm going to see if I can. I can't go back up. I'll have to take my deep breath here. Um, identifying the towns in solitaire in the field. Um, I, I actually uh, was out in the field yesterday. And this uh, one, two of them showed up um, north of the Phoenix area in the Tano National Forest on the way up to the campground of, of Seven Springs. And I was out there and that's a good good place to find towns in solitaire in the winter. Um, and it's a, it's, it has the nice erect posture of a, of a, um, of a, a robin. Um, it, it'll give you a feel for a robin, but you also kind of think, Mm, maybe maybe a misshapen mockingbird. It's kind of long-tailed, uh, smaller bill, grayish color. Uh, the patches on the wings, let me see if I can get that back, um, that are beige-ish or, or um, brownish, um, do, do not show very well in the field. It looks like an, it's, it's often pretty far away. And, um, but you can, you can tell it by its posture and size and overall thrush-like feel. And maybe I should say something about th the thrush-like feel. Um, there are over 150 th species of thrushes across the world, um, but, um, and we only have, I don't know, about a dozen of them here in, in the United States. And, uh, but they are long-legged and they're, they're erect. They're mostly ground birds, 
But Toronto and Solitaire, in my experience, has been one that, that sits high, and that's how I saw it yesterday. It sits high in a, in a tree and um, uh, allows itself to be seen. Um, and in the spring, they vocalize, so that, that helps too. I'm still having trouble advancing here or going back, <laughs> quite frankly. I'll try one more time, then I'll stop share and get back in. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and then hopefully uh, get back into sharing. And from the current slide here. There we go, and let's see if we can go back there. I wanted to show you on the um, on the wing bars there that does not show up well in the field, and the front of this bird is pretty much the same color as the back of this bird. The eye ring can be fairly prominent or not too prominent at all. Um, so just those couple of those little tips. Okay, we're going to talk about some of our spotted thrushes here. Um, We've got on the top left there uh, is our is the hermit thrush, and that's the only one that we find regularly in Arizona. But it's quite common in the winter, um, and it's a it's as I said, thrushes as a general uh, description, long legged, um, usually on the ground. Uh, this is this is a classic example of this bird uh, for a um, a hermit thrush. You know, look for the coppery tail. Um, which can go coppery in the wings too, overall kind of a, a more uh, muted brown on the back and then, then pretty significant speckling on the front. Below it is the wood thrush that shows up um, irregularly in Arizona. It's all over, got that coppery back. Um, it's pretty distinctive. That spotting goes all over the chest. Um, my experience with the wood thrush is, is limited because um, <laughs> we don't see them very often. But again, often a ground bird are very low to the ground. They're, they're doing a lot of hunting on the ground for food. So that, that brings them to the ground a lot. On the top right is a veery. Veeries are kind of like washed out wood thrushes to me. Um, they're smaller um, and they're, they're just, just uh, a lot more muted tones, uh, obviously not speckled all over the front um, and, and just, just looks like a wood thrush has been washed a lot um, so that it's faded. Um, wonderful, wonderful voice. So hopefully we'll, we'll do some sharing uh, of, of sounds here. And then at the bottom there on the right is a Swainson's thrush. And the only way you're gonna tell that, I think easily from a, from our hermit thrush um, is that the, there's not a coppery tail. It's pretty much all the same color from the back on down. It looks like it's a little bit different and it may, it may have some difference, but uh, you'll see um, if, if you ever see a hermit thrush you go, it's a hermit thrush, but where's its coppery tail? It may be a Swainson's thrush coming through. Um, not likely, but we can try. All right. Um, okay, I do have to shop. I forgot to put in um, my uh, 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 share sound. So let me stop the share here and go back to share screen and share sound and go back to here. And from current slide. All right, let's see. If... Oh, okay, we're on a Viri. I, yeah, I guess we went on the Viri here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes. So the Viri sound I think is really lovely. Um, let's try that again. Should go again here. Can you hear that? There we go. So some people analogize this to um, calling down a tube. Uh, that, that it echoes as it goes down the tube. I think that's a, that's a wonderful analogy. Hear this in the Eastern forests. Don't hear it here in the West, unfortunately. All right, uh, we're gonna go on to the Swainson's thrush and let's see if we can get that sound to work too. 
Uh, more musical. The thrushes are known for their musical sounds. So let's see what this one sounds like. Whoops, excuse me, I need to go back here. Some, sometimes the um, mouse is so sensitive. You got another thrust going on in the background there, I think. So I'm going to go back up here. Oops. Okay. I'm going to go back up a little bit here. All right. Um, I want to see if there's anything I want to um, share about those two, these two birds. These are Eastern birds, um, but I did want to share the sound, but we'll go on to the ones that we will more likely to hear, see in the West here. Um, okay, close that. All right, um, yeah, here's a, this one I'm going to um, get off the Cornell website here. Um, if I can find it. Uh, let me see here. Yeah. Probably one of my very favorite songs. And one we can hear in the West. That's the exciting part of this bird. <laughs> we don't always, we can't hear the ones from the East. Just a haunting, beautiful song. And I will go back to my Oh, the, excuse me. I just did the 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 um, the hermit thrush. Let's do the wood thrush here. Okay. Also a haunting, beautiful song. And I think I have to. Um, I'm going to have to go into. Uh, Um, I am not, here we go. Here's the wood thrush. Lot, lots of uh, different sounds from the wood thrush. I guess that's why the hermit thrush is my favorite. Okay. So we've listened to the, the, the hermit thrush. Um, this is the one that we can hear if we're up in the higher elevations in Arizona. Um, with that beautiful haunting sound. I think um, you put this this up momentarily and now we're ready for it. And while I, um, there we go. Here we go. Countdown's on. All right. Those were lovely bird songs, Kathy. Well, I'm sorry they weren't all, uh, with the right bird all the time. But. <laughs> well, it's like being out in the wild. You never know when you'll hear it. Yes, uh -huh. at least we get to hear the hermit thrush, which is just, just um, very nice. Just all right, we're ending the poll now. Okay. Yeah, right. the results. It, wow, 100%. And that's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly right. You guys are not fooled by that question. <laughs>
Okay. We'll see. Um, so uh, this, one thing that's interesting about hermit thrushes, while I try to get my PowerPoint to advance again, is that um, in the east, they, uh, uh, east of the Rockies, they nest on the ground. And in the west, um, they're more likely to nest in trees, which I think is really interesting that the two populations are nest in entirely different spots. The other thing, um, uh, about hermit thrushes, the populations have remained fairly stable. Um, uh, but like most uh, migrant songbirds, hermit thrushes migrate at night and they are subject to um, window collisions because of that. Um, they can also be drawn to um, uh, transmission towers. Uh, and uh, let me see whether this is gonna advance now. Not quite. Also, forest fires have an impact on the um, hermit thrush population. So given our dreadful uh, few years of forest fires here in the West, we're probably going to see um, uh, a decrease in the hermit thrushes. I have not been seeing these guys as much even just this year than uh, as opposed to others. And, and at the end of the, um, when we start taking questions, if, if you have similar um, observations, I'd be kind of curious to hear that. I haven't heard any scientific response yet, but um, uh, that's certainly been my own response is that they are not simply not showing up um, like usual. Okay, let's see. Close that. Not advancing. So let me stop the share, get back in here, and see if we can advance. Okay. Ta da! All right, so um, this is a, uh, an artist's rendition of um, taking dead birds that have hit windows. And you can see a hermit thrush pointed out by the arrow there. And you can, if you look around that circle at the same size birds, you can see a fair number of hermit thrushes there with the speckly throat um, as, uh, I don't know why that they may be particularly susceptible to running into windows um, and towers, but they are um, amongst the casualties there. All right. Let us go on to the American Robin. We'll spend some time with the American Robin because this is, this is such an iconic bird. Um, I, you know, think about the Robins in, in culture. Um, you know, they, they just have an outsized uh, presence. They, they show up in songs. Um, they're considered harbingers of spring. Um, and uh, they, they, people are named Robin. Um, and uh, Robin's Egg Blue is, is something that people know about. Uh, and I, again, during the question and answer time at the end of the presentation, I would love to hear any other input about American robins and culture. They just occupy a, a pretty sizable um, spot. Again, I, I've chosen a couple of uh, young robin pictures uh, to contrast with the adult. <laughs> you would go, really, that's a robin? Um, and it is. Maybe you can see some of the, the you know, the russet color coming in on the side, um, the eye ring uh, coming into prominence. But yeah, that looks like an entirely different bird. Uh, the speckledy chest shared by the, the thrushes that we have looked at. Um, so here's, here's your next quiz. How many centimeters or inches or feet of earthworms do as a robin ingest in a day? We've got some people coming in and okay. uh, 10 more seconds to go. 
This is not something, <laughs> okay, this is not something I observe much in Arizona. No, we don't have that turf-like grass a lot with earthworms in them. Um, it is something that I used to observe uh, in, in the East, of course. Those of you who chose C, that is the accurate answer. Good for you. <laughs> um, they are eating a lot of earthworms. Um, and when, when, um, let me get to my Robin page on my notes here. Um, robins were actually, uh, American robins too, were um, con uh, considered very tasty in pie. And robin pie was quite popular uh, back when people were eating a lot of, um, a lot more wild things. Uh, so that if people wanted to, um, to have robins in their yards for, for dinner, uh, they would import earthworms uh, so that uh, they'd be nice and fat. So yes, that's, that's um, the, the robin earthworm connection there. All right, let me uh, try to advance. I'm gonna stop share, go back in here. I don't know uh, why the, the, um, the, um, the poll seems to interfere with the, with the advancing the slides there. All right, so how about this one? Everybody's probably seen this if they've watched uh, Robin's feed um, for earthworms and other things to be yummy in, uh, in, the, in the ground. They are mostly insect eaters. Uh, so what, what's happening here? All right, thanks for voting, folks. Here we come. Here's our results. All right. I think I'm going to predict this one. Not too many people are going to say A. Some people will say B, and some people will say C. I don't see the results. Are they coming up? Ah, there they are. Yeah, that <laughs> the fact that you chose B is um, is certainly the um, <laughs> what most people think. <laughs> they but they are not listening for earthworms. They are actually looking. Um, you, you know, robins and 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 most birds, except for hawks and and owls and a few others, their eyes are on the side of their heads and their focal points are toward to <clears throat> guard against guard against predators. So they are you know looking around. But if they want to look at the ground, they have to cock their head and get their focal point to look at the ground, and that's what they're doing. Um, they are not actually listening. They are actually looking. So I'm going to close this and get out of my share and go back in right away so that we can move along here. Um, there we go. And from current slide. There we go. Whoops, that's not the current slide. But it is the next slide. So <clears throat> I wanted to, to talk a little bit about the English robin. Um, they are not at all related, as you can imagine, by just by looking at the size and the shape of this bird. They're not at all related to the American robins, except that they um, share that, that rusty red breast. They also have an outsized cultural aspect in England, which Chris, if we have time, I'd love for you to share that at the end of the program. Um, they are, but they have the same, you know, big cultural influence or, or, or presence in culture in England as, as um, our Robins do here. As a result of that, um, when the English came over to colonize the, the United States, they named pretty much every bird that could possibly be look like a robin as a robin of some kind. So I have here a series of slides uh, with other 
bird <laughs> robin names that have changed over time. And there's, there's an Oriole. You can see why that one would look like a robin to some people. That's our Baltimore Oriole. It used to be called Golden Robin. I can't find the robin um, look-alike in the cedar waxwing, although this is a bird that people love. Um, I, I don't know anybody who doesn't like cedar waxwing, so maybe just because it was a popular bird, um, it became the Canadian robin. Um, there is a robin snipe. You can see why that one was called um, a robin, but it's, it's not even a snipe for our purposes. It's a red knot. Uh, very, very abundant on the East Coast over in colonial times anyway, not so much now. And um, how about that Eastern Towhee, um, now, Eastern Towhee or Rufus Sided Towhee, uh, a ground robin. Well, robins are pretty much on the ground anyway, <laughs> but anyway, you can see the, the rusty on the side. Maybe people saw that one as a, as a, um, uh, robin look alike. This is my favorite, sea robin, a red-breasted merganser. And the red breast can look more red than in this particular photo, but I just thought, wow, not only songbirds um, and, and sandpipers, but also uh, a, a duck named after a robin. Okay, back to the American robin. Um, let's uh, see if there's anything else I want to talk about. I am not going to do the song here. Um, I'm, it, I don't think it's going to come up on if I, oh, does that come up for you guys? Can you now see the, um, I don't know what you see on your screen. We're seeing the American Robin. Uh, in the PowerPoint or in, in Cornell Lab? In the PowerPoint, still with oh. the four photos. In okay, so Cornell lab, lab came up for me. So why don't you enjoy the, the photos there and I will do the song. This is translated in, in the Cornell website as cheerily, cheer up, cheer up, cheerily, cheer up, cheer up, cheerily. Um, so you can, uh, we'll go for a little bit longer there. And, and maybe that's one of the reasons why American Robins are so popular. And it's just that that song is just so so cheery. <laughs> um, they have other voices as well, but um, we'll go with that one. All right, I think last but certainly not least is a very thrush. This is not a bird that shows up very often in, in Arizona. I've only seen it once at the Hacienda River Preserve, and it was a very fleeting view, but I thought, what else could this be? Um, it's a pretty striking bird. Um, and uh, it, you can see its range is, is in, the, in the Northeast and uh, that's where you would have to go and, and find it. Um, but it's, it's uh, a, a beautiful bird that, that stripe across its bib um, doesn't, could, couldn't be anything else that I, I can think of. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting, it's got an interesting uh, habit for food. Uh, they, they seize dead leaves and throw them up, uh, aside and then hop backwards to clear a spot of ground before they examine it for prey. And that, I mean, other than having a better visual, that it seems like a very um, complicated behavior that's actually unexplained. Um, so uh, that, that's our, our very thrush. I think that might be the last... Oh, we got, we even have a question here. So why don't we go with that one? And I gave, just gave you the answer, quite frankly. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Kathy. <laughs> I don't know whether they're fastidious. I, I, that, that would be interesting <laughs> to find out if, if uh, you know, we, we attribute uh, some human characteristics to birds. I, I, you know, scientists aren't supposed to do that, um, but uh, observes, uh, observers, I think that's the way we relate to birds is to try and figure them out. Yeah, it's pretty much unexplained. We really don't know um, what the story is on, on this um, uh, uh, behavior. 
So I am going to stop my share for a second and then go back in and see if there's anything else on my on the PowerPoint. But I think that's the last slide. Um, uh, yep, that is the last slide. OK, so we have a few minutes for uh, questions or observations. Um, uh, after after hearing about these different thrushes, we, we are lucky to have some, some beautiful thrushes um, by both voice and appearance. So do we have some questions or input? If anybody wants to ask a question, you could type it in the question and answers or raise your hands and we'll get to you as we can. And Kathy, you mentioned <coughs> robins. Of course, uh, I'm from England, so grew up with uh, the little European robin, one of um, certainly my favourite birds, and it's the national bird of, uh, of England as well. So, oh, I didn't know that. Uh -huh. Yep, it's uh, everyone's favourite. They had a poll in the Times newspaper back in the 60s, and it was voted as the, the favourite, and every time they repeated it, it stayed the favourite, everyone's favourite. It wasn't always called the robin, though. It was uh, known in Anglo-Saxon as the ruddock, which uh, again is its, its reddish nature. It relates to that. It's also known as the red breast as well. But robin became um, kind of the adopted um, favorite familiar name for it, linked probably to a, a kind of a sprite character in um, folklore called Robin Goodfellow. And so robin was one of these names. Robin Hood's another another one that's a, a favorite name and so of course it became associated with a favorite bird. Yeah, um, it does it, it's not a thrush, uh, does it have a sweet song? It has a wonderful song, yes, a very sweet, very high, lovely, lovely sibilant song, um, quite a, a nice song during the, the, uh, the breeding season but it also sings in winter, it's very very territorial bird and so in the winter time both males and females will also sing to defend a winter territory but not, not in this case to attract a, a mate. So the, the song isn't quite as strong, um, the subtle differences between the summer and winter songs, but they're just wonderful little birds. If you're a gardener at all and are digging up the earth, they just come and hop around by your feet to pick up worms. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, everyone loves them. They sometimes come in the homes as well. Oh, they will over do. Over winter. They will do it. Very easy if you get mealworms or, or, or get some worms, it's quite easy to get them quite tame and coming onto your, your hand for food. Um, they're just delightful little things. And it's no wonder that wherever the, the, the British people basically, or Europeans anyway, colonized in the world, they always, whenever they found a slightly reddish breasted bird, they called it a robin. So there are <laughs> birds called robins all around the globe. Interesting, interesting. All right. We have a question from Nancy. And uh, Nancy, if you'd like to go ahead and, and ask your question live. She's muted, it looks like. Unmute your microphone. Uh, not hearing her. There we go. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, watching bluebirds, which I have in my yard here in the east uh, every year, um, I tend to see the male predominantly singing. And his singing usually ends up at one of three boxes, as though he's telling the female, will you please come and check this box out? This is a good <laughs> box. I mean, I'm anthropomorphizing there. But um, with the idea that we, I don't, I rarely ever see him taking nest materials to the box. She predominantly does that herself. You're once right. she decides which one, which one she uh thinks is appropriate. Is that behavior the same or has it been noticed one way or the other in the Asia bluebird out in Arizona? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it is very similar. I think that's a bluebird um, behavior with all of the species is, is the, the female does the, he, he has, he's chosen some places, but she does the nest building. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, any more questions, folks? Well, I think we, uh, we've got them all involved with the polling. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> and uh, questions have been answered. <laughs> 
It's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that fabulous talk, Kathy. Wonderful to not just see the images, but hear the sounds as well. Um, and that really is lovely to hear now because obviously things are just starting to sing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's heralding the spring. Um, we've got all of that to look forward to hear, hearing some of these sweet sounds. It's wonderful. Yes, perfect timing. Mm. All right. Well, that was wonderful. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you everyone for joining us today. And if any of you came in late to this talk and want to hear it uh, in its entirety or maybe want to hear the whole thing again, it's being recorded and this talk will be available uh, via a, a Zoom link for 30 days. And we'll also be storing it on our YouTube channel for anyone to watch, uh, to listen to and watch at any time they, they want. So yes. um, yeah, look out for that. Um, next month, we're very much uh, looking forward to welcoming Glenn Maynooth, who I think is with us at the moment. Um, he'll be talking, his, his talk will be called 12 New Clouds talking about uh, different clouds and some new ones that have been defined mm -hmm. recently. So very much looking forward to Glenn. And that's going to be on Wednesday, uh, March the 24th, at the same time, 11 o'clock in the morning, Arizona time. Yes. Good. Great. Okay. Well, I think that does it for us. Yep. And Kathy, congratulations on everything new in your life. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, perfect time for spring. Yep. Yes. Uh -huh. Thank you everybody for joining us. Everybody stay well and be safe out there. And we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you. Thanks Thank a you. lot. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye. Kathy.